Hey guys, welcome. For the last month, I have been rebuilding my player controller for my game Surgebound from the ground up. And if you've never tried to build a platformer controller, just know that it's extremely difficult. And I would even argue that making a satisfying controller for a 2D game is exponentially harder than for a 3D game because the level of precision has to be so, so high. And because I've rebuilt my architecture from the ground up, naturally I've done a lot of research and I've done a lot of trial and error. So I figured why not just take everything that I've learned and put it into one video. So this is not a tutorial. This is a high level view on what it takes to make a 2D player feel good to control. We're gonna take a look at the common types of controllers you can use, as well as specific tricks that you should be implementing to make your controller feel really good. We're even going to discuss player size. Is there a rule for how large your player should be? Turns out there is. So let's get right into it and discuss the different types of controllers that you can implement for your game. Where everyone almost always starts, myself included, is a dynamic rigid body controller. I'm going to be talking in Unity terms specifically because that is my engine of choice. But no matter what engine you use, these types of controllers are basically all going to be the same. Just some of the terminology might change. But Unity has a built-in component called Rigid Body 2D. This uses Unity's built-in physics engine. So you have gravity right out of the box. You have collision detection right out of the box. And you have all these different effectors you can play with as well, like buoyancy, constant force for something like wind, various joints as well as surface effector for one-way platforms. So one of the reasons this controller is so popular is because it saves you so much time and effort. However, adding some more of the advanced techniques that you're going to want becomes pretty difficult with this type of controller. Corner corrections fairly difficult to implement. Same with adding support for slopes because friction is taken into account with this type of controller. Moving on platforms can be prone to jitter. So to solve all of these problems, you'll have to code up some fairly hacky solutions to get past them. I'm not going to say don't use this type of controller in all scenarios because that's not true. If you are building a game where the character needs like physical weight or you wanna be able to swing on ropes easily or be knocked back by explosions in a realistic manner, just in general have more realistic physics in your game, then then using this type of controller will save you months of development time. Okay, so the next two that we are going to discuss are industry standard and they are meant for high precision platformers. The first is the kinematic raycast controller. This one is really, really nice. I use it. Sebastian Logs, popular series that mine is inspired from, uses it. Even Corgi Engine on the Asset Store, which has a really nice character controller included, uses it as well. What defines this type of controller is that we use Raycast to detect where the colliders are in the world. So we're shooting out a bunch of rays to store a whole bunch of information about whether we're grounded, whether we're on a slope, and we use that information, like the distance from our ray to our collider, to keep our player out of the level geometry. Because floating point calculations are prone to small errors. We use what's called a skin width or a collision padding amount. It's usually something small like 0.015. And we move that far inside the character and shoot the rays out from there. That is why this controller is not so prone to getting stuck on the tiniest little cracks and crevices in your level geometry. And because we're shooting out a bunch of rays, this controller is perfect and the ideal choice for slopes. Ray casts will return perfect normal information. So you can align your velocity with the angle of the level geometry. And since friction is not an issue on this controller, that's actually a good thing because we won't start sliding down a slope that we're just idling on top of. What I'll say about this controller is it's probably the most expensive computationally. We're casting out usually four to eight rays vertically and four to eight rays horizontally, sometimes more, every single frame. Now, if we're being real, for modern CPUs, this is completely negligible. But if you have a really, really tight performance budget, then this is just something you're gonna wanna keep in mind. There are a lot of names for this next one, so I'm just gonna call it pure or AABB. This is the architecture that Celeste is built on, and it is considered the best model for pure determinism, meaning it's so precise and the outputs are so identical regardless of the hardware they're used on that you can use tool-assisted speedruns to replicate inputs with 100% accuracy, which is a thing that is highly, highly valued in really hardcore platforming communities. Not that this is not possible with other controllers, that's just one of the things that this one is known for. The velocity is stored as floats and if we want to move forward by say 5.6 pixels the integer part so 5 is used for the immediate move call and the remainder of 0.6 is added to a stored remainder variable and when that remainder reaches 1 then we add that to the next movement call this 
guarantees determinism. The other great feature is that clipping through geometry is virtually impossible with this model. Instead of trying to prevent collisions ahead of time like a Raycast controller does, this one lets it happen and then when it detects that collision it backs the player up by one pixel. It has a pretty low performance cost as well. The biggest drawback with this architecture is the high, high level of complexity for setting it up. I haven't tried this one myself, I would love to for fun sometime, so I'm getting this just from research alone, but all of my research indicated that this is by far the most complex to set up. Also, if you want to handle slopes with this type of architecture, you're going to need some sort of hybrid custom solution, since this was mostly meant for kind of 90 degree walls. Now with all these controllers, there's obviously different variations and different hybrid models. I've seen shape cast controllers instead of array cast controllers, which are a lot cheaper to use, but they're not going to give you that precise normal information you're looking for if you want to add slopes. I've seen other D penetration models that let you into the geometry and then when they detect that collision they pull you out just like the pure AABB model but without all the integer stuff. Unity even has this new rigidbody 2 dslide method that I know almost nothing about, but I've heard that it's meant for kinematic controllers and it's meant to make slopes a lot easier to manage. So obviously there's many different types of controllers and many different ways of making those controllers, but high level generally what you're gonna see is some variation of what we've just talked about. Before we move on to specific tricks that are gonna make your platformer feel really good, I wanna take a quick second to thank this video's sponsor, Coursera. We kinda just glossed over some really heavy concepts, handling floating point errors, calculating slopes from raycasts, and kinematic physics. I mentioned earlier that I changed my architecture from the ground up and that involved a lot of trial and error. If you want to rely less on trial and error and more on foundational knowledge, you should check out Coursera. Coursera is an online learning platform that partners with world-class universities and industry leaders like Google and Microsoft. If you're trying to wrap your head around some of the math that we just discussed or you want to understand the architecture behind a Raycast controller, you can dive into a C-sharp programming for Unity game development specialization or even grab a professional certificate in computer science fundamentals. Learning from experts is the best way to bridge that gap between following tutorials that you don't really understand to actually engineering your own systems, like a custom character controller. So if you are ready to level up your game dev skills, then check out the link below in the description to get started. And you're gonna get 40% off for three months of Coursera Plus. Huge thanks to Coursera for sponsoring the channel. All right, let's talk about game feel. The mark of a really tight player controller is one that favors player intent over realism. Realism is not fun. That is one of the reasons why making a 2D character controller is so hard. How do we figure out our player's intent and make that happen on the screen with nothing but input? from our player. I'm gonna skip right past the basics like variable jump height. That is just something that most players expect at this point, but there are other specific tricks that you should implement into your character controller to make it feel fair, forgiving, but most importantly, match player intent. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but typically when the player presses jump, you don't just check is the player on the ground and if they are, let them jump. People don't have immediate reaction times. There's a delay between seeing what's on the screen, registering that in your brain, figuring out what button to press and actually pressing it. So typically what we do is we start a timer. And if we hit the ground before that timer expires, then we allow that jump to happen as soon as we hit the ground. The timing for this varies, but it usually is around 0.1 seconds. Too short and it's not gonna solve the problem you're trying to solve. If it's too long that it results in jumps that the player didn't actually want and you're ruining player intent. Now the thing that I don't hear often enough is that buffering should apply to more than just jumps. If there is an action that a player can perform that requires specific criteria involving the ground, it should be buffered. I have a dash buffer in my controller. So if you press dash just before hitting the ground, you'll dash once you do hit the ground. Same with a wall jump actually. Now if you're implementing air jumps, this can get a little bit tricky and kind of messy, but if you press jump and you hit a wall before your buffer timer expires, you should wall jump once you hit the wall. This is the opposite of buffering. So instead of pressing the button too early, we pressed it a little too late. We ran off a platform and now we're in midair. And to make this fair and follow player's intent, we should also have a timer that starts counting down once we leave the ground. And if we press jump within that window, then we let the player jump, even though they're not grounded. And just like with buffering, this should apply to more than just jumps. If you press dash after just leaving a ledge, you should let the player dash if they're within that right window. If you just left a wall slot, and you press the jump button just a hair too late, you should still wall jump, even though you're not technically on a wall. 
If you jump and just the one far pixel of your head hits the ceiling, it is immediately frustrating to players if that registers as a head hit and they just fall straight back down. If you're not familiar with Celeste, it is considered one of the best platformer controllers of all time. It specifically checks for four pixels of width and height around the player to guide them around obstacles. Subconsciously, the player feels like they're navigating all these tight gaps, but really the code is assisting them. This one is generally gonna be more relevant to games that have combat systems. And Dead Cells actually is a really great example of this. There's a really strong hack and slash flow that game gets you into that feels really good. And the reason isn't necessarily the way that you play, it's the way that the game is coded. Defensive and movement options are always a higher priority than attacks. If you press the dodge roll button, it can immediately cancel the start or recovery frames of just about any attack. If you press attack, then jump really fast, depending on your timing, either your attack stops and you just jump in instead, or you jump and attack. Either way, you're never just locked in and just going to take damage because you pressed the wrong button. I wasn't really sure of a better name for this. All I mean is the size of the colliders in your game. This is another really critical component of a good feeling controller. And Celeste, once again, is one of the best case studies for this. It has a philosophy that it follows, which is basically bad things are smaller and good things are bigger. Meaning spikes, for example, have hitboxes that actually retract two to three pixels into the base of the sprite. But items like dash crystals or strawberries have hitboxes that extend beyond their visual sprites. The player's hurt box is thinner than her visual sprite bright, which allows for really tight escapes that feel incredible to pull off. One really important thing we want to avoid at all costs is called screen crunch. This happens either when a character takes up such a large percentage of the screen or their max speed is so high that the distance between the character and the edge of the screen, it's insufficient for reaction. This is probably why I always found Sonic to be so frustrating to play on the Genesis. I couldn't react that fast. If a character moves at 300 pixels per second and the screen edge is 100 pixels away, you only have 0.33 seconds to react to any kind of hazard coming your way. The general human reaction time is 250 milliseconds plus any input latency. And even outside of that, the choice of how big your character is, it affects game feel as well. A tiny character in a standalone room feels like a cavern, whereas a large character makes it feel like a corridor, which isn't great unless you're going for that. And as it turns out, there seems to be an actionable rule that you can follow. And it depends on whether you're mainly going for precision or combat. For games that are focused mainly on movement or aerial maneuvering, characters that are six to eight percent of the screen height seems to be the standard. Ori is anywhere between four to six percent of the screen height depending on the zoom. Celeste renders at a native resolution of 320 by 180 pixels and Madeline the protagonist is 11 to 12 pixels tall. That is 6.66 percent. On the other hand if your game mainly focuses on combat and you need to be able to read telegraphs really well then you're going to want to zoom in a little bit and you're going to want your player to be 10 to 12 percent of the screen height. Hollow Knight renders at 1920 by 1080 and the player takes up 130 32 pixels, so 12.2% of the screen height. In Super Mario World, all the way back from the SNES, it rendered at 256 by 224. Small Mario was 16 pixels tall, 7.1% of the screen. So somewhere between 6 to 12% of the screen height seems to be the sweet spot. I really hope you found this interesting and helpful. If you liked this video, do me a favor and hit the like button. That is all I got. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.